Hello and welcome to Factually. I'm Adam Conover. Thank you so much for joining me once again as I talk to an incredible expert about all the amazing things they know that I don't know and that you might not know. Today, we're going to be talking about hot dogs. That's right, a whole hour on America's iconic tubed meat. Love them or hate them, hot dogs are woven into American culture. They're the kid-friendly food boiled in water. They're a regular guest at baseball games and summer barbecues. For some, they're an easy budget meal option and an efficient use of slaughterhouse meats. But they're also a grotesque warning about everything that is wrong with how we treat the animals we eat and the workers who process them. What I'm saying is hot dogs simply are America in all its forms, good and bad, all right? And we're not just talking about them because it's summer and I'm hungry, though both things are true. We're talking about hot dogs because I just read an incredible book called Raw Dog by the comedian Jamie Loftus. Jamie, who you might know from her hit podcasts about Mensa, Kathy Comics, and the book Lolita, does investigative comedy in a way that is completely unique and totally fascinating. And in this book, the way she synthesizes history, food criticism, and incredibly funny comedy writing with a deep and unsettling investigation into the American meat industry is after my own heart and just incredibly fun to read. I know you're gonna love this conversation, but before we get to it, I just wanna remind you that if you wanna support this show, you can do so on Patreon. Just five bucks a month gets you every episode of this show ad-free. We even do a community book club. Please join us, patreon.com slash Adam Conover. And if you enjoy stand-up comedy, just a reminder that I am on tour. If you want to come see me do stand-up near you, head to adamconover.net for tour dates and tickets. And now, let's get to my interview with Jamie Loftus. Uh, Jamie, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm excited. I'm very thrilled to have you here. Uh, you're one of my favorite investigative comedians. I think that's that's a term I sometimes apply to myself a little bit self-importantly. I don't love it that much, <laughs> but I actually do apply it to you. I think we uh, we Likewise. share a uh, Oh, thank you. Well, we share a similar sensibility of finding what is funny in what is true and weird about the world. Mm -hmm. Uh you have this new book about hot dogs called Raw Dog. I love this book so much. I've never read a book like this before in my life, to be honest, cool. where it's both uh, a history of this disgusting food stuff where you alternately praise it and excoriate how horrible it is. Um, <laughs> it's also a memoir about your own fucked up life, if you don't mind me saying so. No, totally it's also, correct. It's, it's also very funny. And guess what? It seems to be selling like hotcakes or like hot dogs. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm like, I, I'm just, I, 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 c congratulations to you. It's so cool Thank to have you. you here to talk about it. And and I hope you're happy with how the book is being received. It's been so great. Yeah. I mean, like I, there's, uh, it's hard to know how a book about hot dogs is going to do. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's not many of them. I was hoping that would work in its favor, but you know, there's always the chance that there hadn't been many for a reason and no one wants them but it's been yeah it's been so nice it's been like a, a really nice summer of uh talking about hot dogs for the, the third summer in a row it might just be forever <laughs> well i i think that that exact emotion well, well no one wants a book about hot dogs and yet we're buying them that's true about hot dogs themselves it's everyone true has a bad opinion of hot dogs. Oh, hot dogs. Ugh, disgusting. I don't like them. Mm -hmm. Could I please have some hot dogs? <laughs> <laughs> like that's so so what I mean, what is it about this food uh that made you want to dive so deep into it? Is it that contradiction and the soul of the hot dog? Yeah, I really like I I liked uh I I just like topics in general where people feel really strongly about something and are not sure why they feel strongly about it. Um and that feels very a very hot dog coded sentiment to me where everyone yeah thinks they're disgusting everyone knows the same sort of five facts about why they're great or why they're gross uh and then everyone eats them anyways <laughs> and uh i lo like i i just i i love that I had a strong feeling about hot dogs and I didn't know why. And sometimes you're like, oh, it connects to my relationship with my father. Other times it's just like, it's so, I don't know. It's, it's an interesting little kind of canvas because I feel like everyone's feelings about hot dogs has something to do with who they are in a weirdly intimate way. Yeah. And so much of the time, like, you know, one of my favorite parts of this book is you uh, sort of reviewing different hot dog places around the country and describing mm -hmm. the hot dog, how it compares to other hot dogs. 
but you're also giving a personal history of your relationship with the hot dog. So sometimes you're just describing you're at a very low point in your life, something very depressing has happened to you, you're eating a hot dog not because you like it, but you just needed something to eat, mm -hmm. and then you're also going, and it had a it had an okay snap, but the bun was soggy. And yeah. <laughs> you're, you're like, so you're combining personal history and food writing in this really uh, fascinating way. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I I tried to, I don't know, like I felt like I would be deluding myself to go into it as if I were a food writer because I just wouldn't have done a very good job. And like, I, I <laughs> have never been like a food writer uh, in detail before this. And so, yeah, it was almost just like, well, what do I know how to do? And it just felt more like going to whatever stand up brand or whatever it is, uh, instead of pretending that I have institutional knowledge that I definitely do not. But you, I'm sorry, you make an incredible case in this book for the hot dog as an a fundamental American, like, regional food. Like, okay, like, if you were going to say, I'm doing a book about pizza, I'm going to go to all different parts of the country and see all the different regional pizzas and talk about the history, mm -hmm. I'd be like, okay, I'm I'm aware that pizzas are like, there's New York pizza, there's Long Island pizza, there's Chicago pizza, right? Mm -hmm. There's New Haven pizza for the people who really know. You know, there's all this... Uh, all of this food culture around pizza. No one ever talks about hot dogs in the same breath. No. And yet you make a case in this book for you go all across the country. You find different regional hot dog styles in every city that have interesting histories that are related to the place that are delicious or less delicious that one can debate or et cetera. You talk the Chicago dog, the uh, the D.C. Ben's Chili Bowl dog, mm -hmm. the Los Angeles <laughs> street cart dog mm -hmm. and that's that is food writing. You you really you really elevated the hot dog in my mind as a fundamental American piece of part of American cuisine. Good, I'm glad. Yeah, I I I mean, I really do. I I really do love the fucking things. They're so good. Like they're and and you try. Well, I've been meaning to ask you. What did you think of your Ben's Chili Bowl experience? I forgot. <laughs> okay, to, I forgot to check in about it because I was. I was texting you because <laughs> yeah. I, I now text you, as I'm sure everyone does, every time I eat a hot dog. <laughs> Look, hot I, Every dog. time I get a hot dog, I'm like, Jamie, uh, <laughs> you wrote a book about hot dogs. I'm here to – and by the way, we don't know each other that well, but we have each other's phone numbers. Mm -hmm. and, but here I am texting you. Probably probably four out of every five texts I've texted you now over the entire course of our friendship has been me telling you, as Jamie, it. I'm eating a hot dog. I wanted to let you know. And I, and I text – Love it. It's great. <laughs> you know, I, and it's similar, I think, to when people say to me – Oh, here's the guy who ruins everything. Oh, you probably are sick of hearing that. And I mm -hmm. say, no, no, no. If you coin a catchphrase, you need to be grateful to hear it every time people repeat it back to you. You have to because live. If, yes. You have to live it. And I feel like you feel the same way. Yes. I mean, I and I truly, it, there are so many things to be associated with in the world. And hot dogs is like one of the easiest <laughs> things. It's like, it's truly not. Because yeah, anytime someone's like, aren't you sick of it? You're like, even when I am, it would be so ridiculous to be genuinely upset about it. Like it would be yeah. so ridiculous. And, and people are walking down the street, they're getting a hot dog and they're thinking of you as they have a happy moment or at it's the very nice. least an intense moment with a hot dog they didn't like. <laughs> yes. So, 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 <laughs> So, so yes, my Ben's Chili Bowl experience is I'm on tour a lot. My favorite thing to do when I'm on tour is to eat uh, regional food. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I'm just in the airport, and that's my only opportunity to eat the regional food. For instance, I've had a Philly cheesesteak in the Philadelphia airport. Not the true Philly cheesesteak experience, but— no, it, but that's so—I mean, I think it's so—Philly and D.C., it's so hard because I— you're, Cause then you have to get on a cross country flight after eating an entire Philly cheesesteak. Like you don't know what your body's gonna do. You don't know what's yeah. gonna happen. But you, but it's your only opportunity. You have to do it. It's hard. The, exactly. Ben's chili bowl at the airport is pretty violent uh, and yep. in, intense. But like you have to go. I'm very glad. And you that's went. what I did. I mm -hmm. was in the D.C. airport. I was. I had not spent the weekend D.C. I was coming back from Baltimore, but I was flying out of D.C. Mm -hmm. And I was literally listening to the audio book of your book. And I had been listening to the part with Ben's Chili Bowl, and then I was like, there's a Ben's Chili Bowl in the airport, uh, but I didn't plan my time properly, so I was like, I was buying the hot, the chili dog 10 minutes before getting on the flight. And <laughs> I was texting you saying, is it okay if I bring a full chili dog onto the plane? 
and you were like, do what you got to do. Yeah. And then what I ended up doing was eating it over a trash can because my flight was delayed by five minutes, which was good for that. That's honestly, great. that delay saved everybody's life. Yes. You, <laughs> then they didn't need to see what you had done and you got yeah. to act like a, a little <laughs> possum. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really did. I really did like a possum. I literally, <laughs> I literally was eating it like with my body contorted over the trash can yeah. so that the chili, because a chili dog to go is a rough thing. They wrapped yeah. it in foil. <laughs> it was, there was like, I hope, you know, it's one of those bags where I opened it. It was already wet inside the bag. Yeah. Um. So, but let me tell you, I enjoyed the hot dog. As you said, it was a classic half smoke with chili. It so had a good, good snap. The chili was tasty. I think a chili dog is generally too much. Like, I agree. But uh, it was, and I will say, I, I have not had the regular Ben's Chili Bowl in D.C., but I felt that it was pretty legit in terms of, it didn't feel like a downgrade. I was like, this must be as good as it is. <laughs> it can't be any better than this in the, <laughs> at the actual store. <laughs> it, I, the airport one, I've also done the airport one in a very similar circumstance. And it's like, you shouldn't do it, but sometimes it's the only option and you can't leave without having the chili dog. So yeah, it's like, it, it, I thought the airport one was pretty good. It's definitely, a chili dog's always going to be too wet and the vessel doesn't really make sense. You need a more toasted bun for if you're going to put that much slop on top, but it's none of my business. And I think Ben's Chili Bowl rocks. <laughs> <laughs> Just suddenly that became like you were doing a testimonial coming out of like a movie in the 90s going like <laughs> Mission Impossible rocks, but you were doing it about Ben's Chili Bowl. But what I so what I love about the book, though, let's just talk about Ben's Chili Bowl for a second, yes. because this is a historic hot dog place mm -hmm. in D.C., but you don't just say, hey, it's a good hot dog place and blah, blah, blah. You talk about the history of the place going back 50, 60 years and how this hot dog interacts with the history of the civil rights movement. Would yeah. you just like tell me that? Uh, it's Yeah, Ben's Chili Bowl has a wild history. It's one of the... Uh, I think it's definitely the most famous black owned hot dog business in the country. Um, I hope I'm not leaving anybody out. But yeah, it's been around forever. Um, it was a big, big deal during the civil rights movement because um, it was, it's been said and it's like difficult to prove, but I'm like, yeah, sure. That the March on Washington was planned partially at Ben's Chili Bowl um, and that they were sort of a, like a hot spot uh, for planning and organizing during the civil rights movement in the DC area. Um, and so it has like kind of this incredible history and they, they are very forward with that history. And then um, sort of as I was sort of tracing the history as it went on, you can see how aggressively gentrified the area got over the years, um, how, you know, sort of in, I think it was like the 90s and early 2000s, uh, there was a big wave of white 20-somethings moving into the area and, you know, sort of the whole gentrification story as we know it now. And now it's, you know, they're across the street from a bank that is like, we love gay people. And you're like, great. Thank you, <laughs> bank. Uh, and, uh, it's, it's this, um, I, I relic is, is not the word I want to use. It's like this iconic, uh, business that's in the middle of such a wildly changing landscape. Escape, but it's constant. Yeah. It's still owned by the family. Uh, it's still partially run by um, one of the original co-founders. And yeah, I mean, it's just like it got this um, really cool history. And so many hot dog places do because they've all been around forever. They all yeah. like, especially in D.C. where, you know, every president that has like it's I think one of sort of the first stops uh, if you are. Uh, elected president, you go to Ben's Chili Bowl because it's important that you have a hot dog because it proves that you're American. Like it's there, there's all this weird stuff tied into it. Mm -hmm. The history of the hot dog is, in fact, the history of America, is what you're saying. To uh, uh, did I did I make it too grand? No. <laughs> yeah, you sound like the guy who runs the Nathan's Hot Dog Contest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, let, let's get into that in a second. Yeah. Um, I, I want to tease that for later in the interview. Uh, if people want to hear all the Nathan's Hot Dog Contest dirt, uh, you got to stick around a little bit. Oof. But um, uh, what I want to ask is, when you w one of my favorite parts of the book at the beginning is you debunk many stories of the history of the hot dog, mm. which I love. Because for every foodstuff, 
there are hundreds of people saying, I invented it, I invented it. And they're all full of shit. They're all just restaurateurs yeah. who are trying to make them. Oh, we invented the Caesar salad. No, you fucking didn't. <laughs> yeah. um, so you actually debunk some and you reveal yeah. the true history of the hot dog, mm -hmm. which uh, perhaps for the first time ever. So what is the history of the hot dog? The history of the hot dog. I mean, I, yeah, it, it underwent the same sort of uh series of trial and error bullshit narratives where it was like it was one guy who was holding a sausage and a glove and his hand got hot and you're just like this is not, <laughs> that's not even a good what? story that's not <laughs> it's always also the fake story is always like a mistake yeah you know it's always yeah. like oh someone came in and they wanted a sausage but we didn't have any because it was Tuesday. So one crazy guy decided <laughs> and that's always fucking bullshit. And the world was never the same. Yeah. And, but I mean, even the myths were, I mean, they're fascinating because they, I mean, not only do they all kind of suck, but they are connected to very American feeling scenarios. So many of them are tied to like the, whatever the world's exhibition in Chicago in 1893. Uh, mm. A lot of them are connected to early uh, baseball games in, in the U S like, it's all connected to this idea of American exceptionalism and then putting this bullshit story about this American dish there. Um, but the truth is that it was just the hot dog was uh, brought over uh, from just countries with sausage traditions in Europe. So mainly Germany and uh, Poland. And, uh, you know, there is a huge wave of uh, immigration and it just sort of became a dish that evolves into street cart food, uh, especially kind of during the Great Depression when there was a need uh, when, you know, as, as the country was industrializing, um, poor people needed something delicious to eat. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. it, it evolved out of those traditions. It wasn't one specific person. It wasn't one specific company. Um, you can sort of trace it to like New York. York and New Jersey, I'll give them that. But outside of that, it it was this sort of um, overtime collective uh, need to be able to eat something on the go in the city as a poor person. And that's the, where it came from. And one of the things I found really fascinating about this is that hot dogs are everywhere across America. If you look at a lot of our other, first of all, all of our best foods are poor people foods, right? Our working Absolutely. class foods. Um, if you look at you know, pizza, bagels, um, anything, anything that people like, even even ramen as a dish. Right. If you look mm -hmm. at the history of ramen in Japan. Right. It's all it's always a working class meal. What can we put out quickly that then, you know, innovative chefs improvise on and et cetera. Right. Um, and uh, those those are the best foods everywhere in the world, bar none. But usually in the U.S., they're somewhat regional, you know, like pizza is, you know, has has a there's New York style pizza, New Jersey, Chicago, et cetera. But we wouldn't say, oh, Los Angeles or San Francisco or I don't know, Louisiana have like, you know, well-established regional pizza styles. Right. It's right. we see these as pizza deserts. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's it's really sad that we don't talk about it enough. We don't talk about the issue of pizza <laughs> deserts. <laughs> Enough, and someone needs to start a foundation to deal with this problem. But but you made the case that hot dogs are everywhere. Almost every city has some sort of regional hot dog style that yes. is distinct and interesting. There are no hot dog deserts, and yeah. why do you think that is? I that's a great. I mean, there's definitely places where hot dogs aren't as popular, but I don't know. I mean, I I think that it. I, that's a that's a great question. I, I'm not totally sure why hot dogs are truly everywhere. I think because after a while they were considered such an American symbol that their association with uh, Greek and Polish and Austrian immigrants that sort of went. I mean that like was less popularly associated with the dish, and then it just became like this little s sausage thing is the American dish. And I think that that is probably why it spread everywhere because it became associated with the 4th of July, it became associated with American summers and all of these really, um, I don't know, things that you don't, or that I didn't really think about as like something that's bonked into your head uh, when you're very young of like, this is just, this is a summer dish. This is, and especially if you are in like a low income family, like it's a dish for whenever it's really easy yeah. to make it. It's really affordable. And I think that it, that it probably spread be, uh, at least in part because of its association with uh, American holidays and American summers uh, for better and for worse. There's like, 
And there definitely is. I mean, I didn't get everywhere that I wanted to for uh, the hot dog book. And every single day, probably for the rest of my life, I will receive at least one email about like, why did you not go to where? I, <laughs> why didn't you go to Kansas to get the Kansas hot dog? And like, I don't. The book can only know. be so long, ma'am. I yeah. I mean, I cut a lot of hot dogs. Hit the cutting room floor. It was a brutal process. <laughs> I couldn't include them all. your feet just surrounded by chopped up hot dog chunks. <laughs> That's kind of what our car was like at different points in the trip. <laughs> just a meat detritus. But yeah, I mean, like every single, at least like major city or, or region has their hot dog. And even places that you wouldn't think would be, I mean, like LA, I feel like is a very underrated hot dog uh, heaven there's so many great mm. hot dogs in LA. More, more people eat uh, hot dogs per capita in LA than anywhere in the in the country, um, which wow. New Yorkers don't want to hear, and they're not ready to have that conversation. <laughs> but it's true, and it's kind of well. Like and also, and also in LA, there is so there's a kind of street hot dog for folks who haven't been to LA that you see all over the place. It's uh, usually usually uh, uh, middle aged older ladies with carts, mm -hmm. and it's got a hot surface, and they're grilling peppers and onions, and they've got bacon wrapped hot dogs. Yes, and these will be outside, you know, clubs uh, like places where people are partying, and they'll also be outside every single Dodger game, soccer game, yeah. any kind of game. Like if you leave an LAFC game, this is a soccer team I go to see often. Mm -hmm. um, there's just like like crap, like a phalanx. <laughs> like just of a hundred women just going hot dog, hot dog, hot dog, hot dog. Yeah. And you can get a hot dog. And, and here's the thing. People talk shit on these hot dogs. People call them For what danger reason? dogs. Yeah. People oh. say, oh, that's a danger, like a uh, danger dog. They say, ah, it's not going to be good. Um, and I've had one and you know, it's, I'll, I'll say it's not the best hot dog I've ever had in my life, but it's mm -hmm. a solid hot dog. And you make the point. These are better than the hot dogs that they serve inside the sports stadium oh. by a mile. And Easily. they're a lot better as a New Yorker, they're a lot better than the street hot dogs in New York, which are just those Sabret <laughs> dirty water dogs. That yeah. is not a quality hot dog. They taste like propane. And I'm saying this as a New Yorker. I was like, that's all right, I'm really allowed brave to say of this. you to say. Yeah. They're not good. Uh, I don't and, and like so, them. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm so, I, I live in fear of insulting the wrong hot dog and like someday someone's going to come for me. It's going to be bad. But yeah, the street hot dogs in LA are incredible. And they, it's, I'm, I'm always stunned at how well, what a well-oiled machine it is where it's truly anywhere in the entire city where you might get drunk. There is a hot dog cart <laughs> outside. Like yeah. you're good. It's covered. Um, I think my last street dog was like after I went to like WrestleMania uh, at SoFi and it was just like a million hot dog vendors. It was incredible. I really like danger dogs. I, and and um, yeah, I mean, Dodger dogs, I've already Dodger dogs and pinks, just trash, not good. Uh, I think that maybe that's why L.A. kind of suffers because our two most sort of famous hot dogs uh, suck. But there's so many good ones. <laughs> And you use this as now, first of all, one of the reasons these street hot dogs are really good. There are hot grilled peppers and onions on the hot yeah. dog. It's not just simply a hot dog on some cold bun. Mm -hmm. It's like there it's a whole dish that you can only get in this one circumstance. Mm -hmm. but, but you use that as a way to talk about street vendors in Los Angeles more generally, the history of street food carts mm -hmm. um, and the precarity that those vendors live under, the way that they've always been harassed by the city. Tell me a little bit about that because I found that fascinating. Yeah, I oh, I had um, gotten into, I think I'd written a story about uh, like food vendors in LA like years before. So I knew a little bit about it, but I never uh, had like laser focused it onto hot dogs because why would you? But this was my chance. And uh, yeah, there, there, I, what I found frustrating and interesting was that there, you know, so many of the mythic stories that uh, these famous hot dog places have, especially ones that have been around for, you know, 80, 90, 100 years, are began as carts uh, that were run by immigrants. And that is still the case of, of most hot dog carts across the country. Um, but in the case of, I think I used um, pinks as kind of an example um, for how this um, how Pink's, I mean, it's a very uh, famous L.A. hot dog institution. Uh, they started as a cart in 1939. They're kind of known as like the hot dog vendor to the stars. 
which I guess <laughs> someone has to be. I don't know. <laughs> when the stars, when Brad Pitt wants a hot dog, you know who he calls his friend, Bob Pink. I don't know Bob, the guy's name. Please go on. I, it may in fact be Bob Pink. There's like, but there's, you can, you can go to Pink's right now and you shouldn't, but you could, and you could get <laughs> the Rosie O'Donnell and it's just a hot dog Rosie O'Donnell likes. And I like, I think that's interesting, but anyways. <laughs> Wait, what's on the Rosie O'Donnell? Wait, I have to check because I've I've had it and I was like, what is she doing? You have to, this? you've had it and you have to check. Yes, I've had so many celebrity. Okay, and then they're also they have they're famous for the Betty White hot dog, which is bare, absolutely oh, nothing. A plain hot dog, just a plain hot dog. Um, which I, you know, I, I guess why I mean, not? Betty, you know, Betty White was, I'm sure watching her health towards the end. So she's, it's, it's a, it's a, oh, the thing with the Rosie O'Donnell dog is it's really long for some reason. It's just it's, <laughs> like, it's much, much like Rosie's career. It's yes. right? Yeah. I think it was supposed to be a symbol for her longevity as a cultural <laughs> thing. Yeah. She had a daytime talk show. Yeah. She was in League of Their Own. Her versatility. You know, the view. Yeah. yeah. So so it's long and then it's sort of like a just a standard like uh chili kraut onion mustard dog. But it's long. And why is that? Um but anyways, pinks. They have all these celebrity hot dogs. Now it's like uh they've franchised, it's this big institution. Um, but they started as a cart. And uh now I think that it's like they're in their third generation of ownership. They've been around for over 80 years. And now the current owners of Pink uh, make it sort of their business to uh, get hot dog carts owned by immigrants off the streets to eliminate competition. What? Uh, what? And yeah. And, and, you know, the current owners of Pink's are they they just love the LAPD so much. And like you see this uh -huh. like these institutions that started because um, it was possible for immigrants to start a uh, small business like a hot dog cart and thrive and grow it out over a course of years. And you see those same businesses trying to prevent that uh, from happening down the line. And I found that incredibly frustrating. And also, I, I guess the more I read about it, you're like, oh, yeah, three generations of hot dog nepot nepotism. And they're so far removed that <laughs> they're now, you know, making it their business to get rid of other vendors. Um, and then there's also great stories about uh, vendors organizing and actually getting big yes. wins from the city, which they have in LA. I mean, it's been back and forth. But over the last couple of years, there's been like some good movement there. And I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I want to. I wish I knew more about street vendors. It's so fascinating and so frustrating to, uh, especially during COVID, like how there were all of these bizarro loopholes um, that were taken advantage of at the at the city level uh, to get street vendors uh, off the street at a time where business is un like you know extremely <laughs> diminished and making it seem like it's a safety issue versus what it actually is. Um, and, and what is it actually? Like, what is the actual motivation for the city or the cops to harass street vendors? Well, I think it's because they are immigrants and I think it's because they're poor. And, uh, and yeah. I think, and uh, that has always been the case. And I read, you know, going back a hundred years in LA, this has like been the case forever, but it's still the case now. The reasoning that the cops and the city will give for doing it tends to change over time. Uh, but it was extra frustrating to me that there wasn't even, you know, a ton of solidarity from successful hot dog businesses and these mm -hmm. carts, because that's what, you know, would be like if, the, if Pink's was actually in solidarity with street cart vendors, that would mean something and that would make a big difference. But yeah, they want to eliminate competition. And so they're not. But the soul of the hot dog is the small vendor. And yes. that's one of the things I find so fascinating uh, because almost every business that you profile here, you, you talk about a couple of big institutions like Nathan's or, or Pink's um, that are big in their region. Nathan's is a chain. But mm -hmm. uh, most of the places you're talking about are mom and pop shops, street vendors, small places. And that is the soul of the hot dog. I read a really interesting as I'm the sort of person I read an article 10 years ago. I don't remember where it was, but I remember the gist. Right. Mm -hmm. And the gist somebody at some point wrote an article that was like, how come there's no fast food hot dog chain? Yeah. Right. If you were to write a book about burgers, 
you would have to deal with McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, not just that, but Shake Shack, Five Guys, in and out When people are debating the best burger spot, they're always talking about Shake Shack versus in and out Who gives a shit? That's not interesting. <laughs> yeah. Those are gigant, giant companies. Mm-hmm. But there is no, I mean, there's Nathan's, sure, small chain, Wiener Schnitzel, I guess. I've never been to a Wiener Schnitzel. Who gives a shit? Wiener Schnitzel is pretty busted. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, it's not, <laughs> it's, that's not a real... That's not a real fast food chain, right? Yeah. So it is fascinating that there is no like McDonald's of hot dogs, despite the fact that this is a quintessential American uh, uh, convenience food. Yeah. Why do you think that is? That I have been trying to get to the bottom of forever. Like there are instances of hot dogs being test drive at places like McDonald's. There was, I forget what region it was, but there was a time where McDonald's was trying out hot dogs at McDonald's in certain regions and it flopped and no one wanted it. And they were like, (laughs) which makes sense. If you went went into a McDonald's and they were like, hey, try the hot dog. We've got a hot dog now. I would walk out of the McDonald's. That would be disturbing to me. (laughs) You're like, man, I'm already here. Like, don't make this harder. (laughs) But they flop. Yeah. why, Why do you feel they flopped? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I've and I read about a series of um, I mean, it's certainly been attempted before. There are small franchises. There's like the the dog house in Southern California. There's a couple of those. Uh, there's a couple of pinks. But yeah, they never really got successful past regional. I don't really observe Wiener Schnitzel as a business that exists because like you're saying, I don't know anyone who's ever been there. Uh, yeah. And I've never passed one and seen people inside. So I feel like it doesn't I've seen, really like count. the building. I'm like, that used to be a Wiener Schnitzel because yes. it's in a weird building. Yes. Like that bank was once a Wiener Schnitzel. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I don't know why it is, but I think that it, because it was never really cracked of like a mm-hmm. national hot dog chain, it, but it sort of reinforces the feeling that everyone thinks that their favorite hot dog is a secret. Um, yeah. And that like, I feel like it almost because I mean, whatever, I, I feel very personally attached to certain fast food dishes. There's like, every, you know, whatever, everyone's very connected to their Taco Bell order. It's not like you can't have an emotional connection with fast food, but it does feel like, yeah, with hot dogs, they're like, well, this is my hot dog and you probably don't know about it, but blah, 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 blah. And, and I, th- I feel like it sort of works in the hot dog's favor, too, because uh, it means that if you have a favorite hot dog, you're probably uh, statistically likely to be supporting a small business, which is great. Yeah. And it means it, it makes it such a more interesting food to learn. I mean, burgers are everywhere and they're either, you know, fast food or they're just, you know, like, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's a less interesting thing to examine. But like a business that is successful and longstanding and is making hot dogs they must be doing something interesting, right? There's got to right. be, they're not just slinging dogs. They're like, there's either a regional connection or they're doing something very special with the dish that they're making that's causing people to come back again and again. Yeah, or someone like, or something local happened there or someone important had been there or not and they're lying about it or the place burned down, <laughs> which like so many of these places burned down over and over and over. There's a place that, I really loved in Baltimore that like, I think it had burned down two or three different times and they had like framed pictures of the times that it had burned down. Like, cause it was just a part of the canon of this deli was that it seemed to burn down at random constantly. It's great. Like it's, you can't get that from a McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't it be cool if every McDonald's burned down all at once and then they all had to rebuild. <laughs> Well, we got to take a quick break. When we get back, I want to talk about the awful truth about how hot dogs are made. But we got to read some ads. We'll be right back with Jamie Loftus. Hey, folks, if your fall is as busy as mine, you are looking to save time wherever you can. And if you're like me, you don't want to have to sacrifice eating a nutritious meal just to steal back a little time. That is why I love Factor. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, can help you fuel up fast with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. With Factor, skip the extra trip to the grocery store and the chopping, prepping, and cleaning up too, (laughs) while still getting the flavor and the nutritional quality you need. 
Factor's fresh, never frozen meals are ready in just two minutes. So all you have to do is heat and enjoy, then get back to crushing your goals. With Factor, you can rest assured you're making a sustainable choice too. They say they offset 100% of their delivery emissions, source 100% renewable electricity for their production sites and offices, and feature sustainably sourced seafood in their meals. So head to factormeals.com slash factually50 and use code factually50 to get 50% off. That's code factually50 at factormeals.com slash factually50 to get 50% off. Can you believe we've had seven months without an NFL game? That's unbelievable, right? Well, good thing that's over. NFL is here and DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL, is giving you a can't miss offer for week one. This week, new customers can get $200 in bonus bets instantly when you bet just five bucks on any NFL game. DraftKings is hooking everyone up with game day greatness. All customers can take advantage of two new offers every single game day this September. Check the app to see what you get. Download now and use code Factually to sign up. New customers can take home $200 in bonus bets instantly just for betting five bucks. That's code Factually only on DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. The crown is yours. I remember when I moved to New York City and I got a hot dog once in the street because I was hungry and I was in a hurry and it was so bad. <laughs> I didn't have another one for 10 years. Wow. And I never knew anybody else who did either. It, it is, was it, that propane, like, scent and flavor is very real it's not good yeah yeah it's i feel that they are only eaten by tourists i feel yeah. that people in new york do not actually eat them people in new york eat dollar pizza that's a local sure. uh a, a local convenience food mm -hmm. bagels certainly bacon egg and cheese mm -hmm. right chopped cheese bodega sandwiches these are the run and run and go grab and go meals that new yorkers eat mm -hmm. but not i i just would never even see anybody eating a hot dog yeah. Um, I'm going to use, I'm going to leave this part in because I want people to hear my expanded thoughts on the New York city hot dog. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can tweet at me if you disagree. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but we got to get back into it with Jamie Loftus. We're talking, I got to know about how hot dogs are made. Uh, you uh, had a harrowing examination of this process. Tell me about it. Yes. So, uh, there, I mean, I feel like that is one of the commonly shared things about hot dogs and why people claim to avoid them, although I don't think they actually do, is that it's uh, <laughs> it's processed meat. Um, and so the conditions and, uh, you know, in, in the way that they're made in American factories, and in, I mean, just the way a hot dog is made anywhere is most likely not ethical uh, for certainly for the animal and often for the employees who uh, work at meat processing plants as well. And it was originally my plan that now I was like, what did I think was going to happen um, to interview people who worked in uh, at plants uh, as well as uh, hopefully touring one myself just to see what is the, you know, sort of sanitized version of how this is shown to journalists. But um, there, I mean, I was only met with uh, slammed doors when it came to that because I was researching it at a uniquely bad uh time mm -hmm. for for meat processing which i vaguely remembered i mean so i did the reporting for this um in the back half of 2021 uh where i was uh touring around over the summer uh getting the hot dogs learning the stories ingratiating myself in the culture and uh then spent the rest of the year uh, writing my first draft of the book and doing research and uh, interviews around meat processing. And uh, I remembered, I don't know, I feel like I was constantly confronted with how much from uh, early COVID lockdown I had it like willfully blocked out mm -hmm. <laughs> because it was just so much, like so much bad news every single day all the time. Um, and so I remembered that in April 2020, there had been an executive order from Trump saying that meat processing plants had to stay open no matter what, like with the underlying, again, it being that American thing, like Americans need their meat, they need their hot dogs. And uh, I remember that being true, but I didn't really follow up on what that meant for the people who worked there. Um, what that meant for the people who worked there, uh, especially at Tyson and Smithfield plants, was that COVID spread like wildfire. There was 
little to nothing done to protect employees who were majority immigrants. Uh, there was a lot of, I've, I've done a lot of subsequent talks with um, meatpacking uh, union organizers and how there has been sort of an institutional struggle to make sure that language barriers are being addressed within uh, unionizing efforts. Mm. But um, that executive order was essentially a bl- like a blank check for Tyson and Smithfield CEOs to mistreat their employees. And at one point, I think that um, meatpacking was like the second most dangerous job you could have in the U.S. during lockdown. Uh, there were. I, I mean, it was the conditions in those plants were just like perfect for COVID to be spread because yeah. it was something about the cold. It was like wet air from the humidity and then people in close quarters constantly mm-hmm. breathing, doing in many cases physical work, which would cause them to breathe a little bit heavier, being mm-hmm. in the same place with other people for like eight hours at a stretch. Like it was just a COVID incubation chamber and none of those places shut down because of the executive order that you're talking about. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, there is um, and and the year after it, in 2022, when I was finishing up the book, there was a ProPublica report that essentially confirmed that uh, Tyson and Smithfield had drafted this executive order and sent it to the Trump White House and it wow. got pushed through. So it was at the highest level. Um, an opportunity was seen to sell more product and they were successful too. Like hot dog sales doubled during lockdown. I know that hot I hot dog sales doubled during lockdown. Why? Yeah. I I think that there's a comfort element to it. I think it's a combination mm-hmm. of comfort and finances where if you were yeah. operating on a reduced uh you know income during lockdown, which almost everybody was, like they were still cheap and they were still possible to get because of this executive order. So it becomes this whole uh, snake eating its own tail thing where it's like the sales did go way up and the executive order from the business, from the CEO's perspective was very successful. But the way that that was accomplished was by literally, you know, essentially willfully killing their own employees. And wow. so it's, it's really, I mean, there's been a lot written about it, but I, I still haven't seen it be a real uh, public discussion and um, going going back uh, because that was like the specific moment that I was covering. But I again just felt very naive uh, in that I was just like, why are th- I thought that after the jungle was published, it was uh, not <laughs> not as bad. Uh, yeah, but of course that's not true. Um, it's yeah. in in many ways it's it's worse than it's ever been. And tracing the history of meatpacking labor where, you know, this is a formerly very, very strong union job that you can have. Um, and, you know, when uh, The Jungle was published 100 years ago, there were two significant laws pushed through to protect both livestock and uh, and the employees of the meat processing plants. But there's been basically no meaningful legislation in that um, space since then, which I was genuinely very surprised at um and also that i don't know i had to reread the jungle because i realized that i guess i had like lied about reading it in high school i definitely was supposed i never to. read it <laughs> i definitely they, were, were we supposed to read it they just told us about it they were just like ah this book uh there, yeah upton sinclair yellow journalism hot dogs i don't know whatever but nobody yeah. oh we didn't read it in my school i for some reason i thought i had read it and then i read it i was like no this is like trying to get poor Americans at the turn of the century to become socialists. Like the, yeah. the hot dog part is a, I mean, is a very, very small element of that book. Uh, but that's the part that people, as you write, latched onto that he, the Upton Sinclair was trying to like cause a, you know, the working class to, to rise up and wage revolution. And said so people read the book and they were like, Oh, meat, that's what's our, in the hot dog. Our meat, yeah. That's what's in the hot dog. The meat yeah. is disgusting. We got to fix this. And that's all that happened Which, was like, <laughs> <laughs> Which is like I don't know what I expected, but it, it is very funny that it it like is this very comprehensive like piece trying to sell uh sell the the working class on socialism as a concept, and it ended up passing two hot dog laws. But they were important. <laughs> they were important Not just hot laws. Dogs, all meat, all meat. It yes. covered all meat. Yes. Yeah. And and those are 
really important laws that are still enforced today. Um, but there's been very, very little that has happened since then. And now um, with sort of the uh, the rise of technology, sure, whatever, the, there, there have been laws not to um, – use tech to protect employees or animals, but, um, to actively, there's been legislation, legislation pushed through called ag ag laws that are designed to prevent, uh, employees from, uh, recording anything inside of a meat processing plant and making it, you know, legally actionable and you would certainly lose your job. Um, and also to prevent journalists or anyone trying to investigate what's going on inside of them yeah. and making it truly like illegal to know what's going on inside of a lot of these factories. Um, and some of them are getting rolled back, but like that's the most significant um, legislation. Yeah. It's one of those things where, you know, in America, when we don't want society to know about something, we sequester it, we segregate it. You know, if you look at prisons, right, prisons are often, mm -hmm. you know, way off in upstate New York or somewhere else remote. You know, it's like, there'll be like the, the, the prison and the town around it that services the prison. And then, you know, no one else ever has to think about it. There's very little reporting about it. That's by design. Same thing is true of meat processing that like where it's yeah. done is in these giant facilities, the entire town just exists to service it. It's all worked by it, you know, mostly recent immigrants who, mm -hmm. you know, their only community is each other and the little town that they live in. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it, you know, it, they take steps to prevent unionization, to prevent the, those folks from having too strong of a community. Uh, and as a result, like we're all eating this stuff, but by design, we're not able to see where it actually comes from. And when on my Netflix show, The G Word, we went to a Cargill uh, beef processing plant. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, we went to go see beef because we were told that pork and chicken would be too disgusting to put on television. Oh, um, they yeah, may have uh, been right about that. No, I think they were <laughs> yeah. probably right. And, and oh, you know, just for visual reasons, we went to go see beef. Yeah. And we, uh, it, you know, we saw quite a lot of the process, but they told us this is the first time we've allowed cameras in here in about 30 years. Mm. Uh, and we only went because we were profiling the USDA. We did talk right. about some of the abuses that you're talking about. We we're profiling the good work that, that people at the USDA do in there. But you also mm -hmm. get a sense that the the conveyor belt, the, the machinery uh, of capitalism pushing these, you know, animals in one end and meat out the other end is so vast and has to move so quickly that mm -hmm. any attempt to regulate the process to make it safer and saner and uh, more ethical just falls by the wayside. Yeah. Uh, you know, this industry is basically just able to control the entire process. You know, the well-being of humans or animals be damned. Yeah, I mean, it's it's I I watched that episode and I was, shh, but I think I saw that as I was writing the book. That I think that that times out right. I was like, how did they get in there? Like it's <laughs> so hard. And yeah, yeah. I mean, I it's incredible that you were able to because it, it's there's like, and I always wonder. I'm like, how? What kind of? I always think about like. I always think of like the Elizabeth Holmes um, example of like Joe Biden was visiting the Theranos uh, offices and she had people over in the next room making it look like it was a real thing when it wasn't. And so they were always like <laughs> one room ahead and like yeah. just barely making it seem like it was like a functional thing that basically existed. And I, I, I'm so curious what that um how like a formal tour squares with what an employee sees. And it seems like it does vary pretty wildly based on the company because it's not like every, I mean, obviously uh, if you are not <laughs> vegan, it's all unacceptable. But if you're a meat eater, there are uh, places, especially, you know, like uh, I think one of the, again, one of the good things about hot dogs being so sort of centralized to small businesses is it's not at all uncommon for um, them to source meat locally and in a far mm -hmm. more ethical way. And like you can know exactly where the meat is coming from. And it's a point of pride for a lot of business owners to tell you like, yeah, that cow used to live here. And you're like, awesome, cool. Uh, and But also, I the best hot dog I had in L.A. recently was somebody had had uh, hired a hot dog cart to come to the picket line. Mm -hmm. As I was eating picket uh, in front of the Netflix building, I was eating hot dogs. I was like, these are great hot dogs. Where'd you, got, where'd you get them? Uh, and the guy was like, these are Kirkland Signature. Like, this, these are the best hot dog 
I've tried all the hot dogs and Kirkland Signature is the best one around. I'm like, all right, he's eating the eating the Costco hot dogs. You know what right. I mean? Well, it's like, and and that is like, uh, that's the Costco hot dog. Is it made as ethically? No. And uh, but it's like it's with hot dogs. It, it's it's unavoidable in the same way that it's like, yeah, I still go to McDonald's. I I know that I'm like committing. Some, I'm you know complicit yeah. in something. Um, but also you're like, but they're, they're hot dogs for the union. How bad could it be? It's so, <laughs> it's so hard. It's impossible. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, I, I love that your book has this tension between your knowledge of where the hot dog comes from and the fact that, Hey, you got to eat, you know, as, <sighs> as we all do. Uh, and that, you know, I, and look, I admire anybody who, who goes vegan and, and renounces hot dogs in of their course. entirety. But I, I don't think that that sort of monkish approach, approach to life, you know, where we all face this conflict in our life somewhere, whether we choose to have that conflict over hot dogs or choose to have it over the clothes we buy mm -hmm. or, you know, any of the other oppressive systems we live under, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we're always confronting that contradiction at some point and having to make our peace with it and figure out how we live an ethical life in spite of it. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was really fascinating to uh, uh, to see you grapple with that right here. I mean, uh, how how do you uh, you know what what goes through your mind now when you eat a hot dog, right? When you take that bite, do you do you imagine <laughs> those workers getting the COVID, or how do you how, how do you try to think about it? I still, when I'm eating a hot dog, think awesome. This is awesome for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, there, there's, uh, I think that, yeah, I get, it's like finding out like, okay, if I am going to continue to eat meat, what is a way that I, because of what I have aggressively learned, what is a way that I can better, um, you know, interact with meat. And so, I mean, yeah, for, for hot dogs, especially it's like, I will, if I possibly can avoid the mass produced ones. Uh, and especially, but especially Tyson and Smithfield, I really do everything I can to not fuck with Tyson and Smithfield food products at all. Um, but hold on a second. These companies are like virtual monopolies. Like if yeah. you're eating meat of any kind in America, you're, you're getting some Tyson and Smithfield. It's true. It's like extremely hard to avoid. And also you have to do the, um, the internal math of like, Oh, Smithfield owns Nathan's hot dogs. Did I eat right. Nathan's hot dogs this year? Yes, I did. It's like, yeah, it's, it's very, very difficult. And so for me, I try to, yeah, buy local when I can and I will like travel with hot dogs from places that I like. It's a mess. It's a mess. There's really no way to be, I mean, and I think that that extends to like, there's no way to really be a meat eater in an industrialized society without being complicit in something. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that I have a, a good answer necessarily. I do think that it's it's good that more people seem to be talking about it or at least thinking about it. Um, at the 2022 Nathan's contest, there was a Smithfield protester uh, that stormed the stage wearing a Darth Vader mask for some reason uh, and was put in a chokehold by Joey Chestnut. And it ended up being amazing for that cause because people are like wait what the fuck was that and then ended up learning about smithfield food and, and all the um how they're like egregiously bad specifically with how they treated their employees during covid and uh you know i i, I do feel like there is something to people just knowing more and i guess yeah, they, where it's like one of the most common things for people to say about hot dogs is like, oh, aren't there dogs in it? And you're like, no, it's it's worse. Sit down. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you. Well, look, you mentioned the you mentioned the, the Costco hot dog. Yes. Uh, we have to talk about the Costco hot dog because there's a myth going around the Internet about it that you bust. What is the mm -hmm. myth and what is the truth? Oh, well, okay. So there's that whole, uh, this, I think the story itself probably is true, but there, how it is a very glorified folktale, uh, with the Costco hot dog that I, I forget. It's always like one's the CEO, one's the president, some weird corporate thing, but, uh, two higher ups at, uh, Costco, one was saying, you know, we have to 
uh, raise the price of the hot dog. We're losing money. It's always been $1.50. That's been the deal. And then I think the CEO or the founder of Costco said, um, if you raise the price of the Costco hot dog, I will fucking kill you. I think is exactly <laughs> what he said. I've seen TikToks about this, but people yes. go, oh, that Costco CEO loves you and your cheap hot dog so much. He threatened to murder his own president if he raised the price of the hot dog. It's uh, so, I mean, it's like, and it's been, yeah, like that story comes up all the time. It's an incredibly effective, especially like, I just was, I was really surprised because there's people that like, I know that love that story. And there's like young yeah. people that love that story and like a whole generation that's been conditioned to fucking hate CEOs that are like but this guy rules and you're like guys <laughs> come on like it's it blows my mind but I think that that is just the power of of the hot dog where it's like that the, the whole purpose of that story whether it's true or not repeated is to endear you to this uh CEO <laughs> like yeah yeah it's it's bizarre what is the real story between why behind why the Costco hot dog has been a dollar fifty for so long? So it's uh, it it feels like I forget what the f phrase is, but it's basically like a, a little psychological trick uh, that is played on Costco members because you can't buy a Costco hot dog unless you're a Costco member. If you want to be a ah. Costco member, you have to pay like seventy five bucks a year or something like that. And not everything at Costco is a great deal. It just is a lot of something. And so there, um, I forget there is like a specific word for this, but um, ha by having at the entrance a freakishly good deal on a hot dog sort of conditions you to think you're about to get amazing deals top to bottom all throughout this the Costco. It's a loss leader. That's, I believe, the yes. term, isn't it? Yes. It's a loss leader. They're losing money on the hot dog, but that makes you think you're getting such a great deal that you'll go and waste money on a gigantic tub of cheese balls. Exactly. So you'll buy 10 pounds of pretzel sticks. <laughs> <laughs> At exorbitant prices, because yeah. your belly is full of dollar fifty hot dogs. Exactly. Yeah, you're tricked into thinking that you're getting a good deal everywhere, uh, but you just had a pretty solid hot dog. I do like the Costco hot dog. But I also find this fascinating because it is locating the hot dog within the history of American poverty foods. Depre I mean, this is like a depression era deal. You yeah. know, mm -hmm. um, it reminds me of these. You used to hear stories about how. Um, Saloons like drinking establishments throughout America used to have a free lunch, mm -hmm. which is where the the phrase there ain't no such thing as a free lunch comes from, because mm -hmm. it was not in fact free. You had to buy one drink, but then you got to eat the free lunch. Yeah. And it was just like a, a buffet sitting out of probably gross food or whatever. Yeah. But there's a there's a history in America of this ve of a very, very cheap food as a way to get people into a business. And mm -hmm. so like this is like through the 30s all over again um, yeah. with this Costco hot dog. And we're, I mean, and we're still falling for it. And I do, I mean, I wonder sort of because we are in a recession and, and, and such a precarious time, that seems like when the hot dog really comes alive again. Uh, is <laughs> hot dog is not associated with times of plenty. Uh, and I so think you're saying your your book is a is a is a bad indicator of the American economy. That's what you're saying. The fact that your yeah. book is a hit says something very bad about our society right now. That things were were going down the tubes. I really do think that my book doing well does not bode well for the country. <laughs> Uh, we're almost out of time. I have to ask you because I teased it earlier about the Nathan's hot dog contest. Yes. Um, you tore the lid off of this story. Um, I cannot, we cannot possibly cover the whole thing, the amount of time we have left. Um, but, uh, you talk about the, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the racist jingoism, uh, inherent in the victory of Joey Chestnut over Kobayashi, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the Japanese hot dog eating hero. Um, who I saw once defeated by you. You make an allusion to him being Whoa. defeated by a bear on yes. television. I saw this very reality show where he was defeated by a bear really? eating. Hot. This, this on one of the funniest Spike? things. Uh, it was on. Yeah, I thought it was on Fox, but oh, okay. uh, maybe he did it twice. It was one of the funniest <laughs> things I've ever seen. Was Kobayashi, who at the time was a big media hero for destroy. He was the Babe Ruth of hot dogs, right? Unbelievable. He came yeah. out and and ate dozens and dozens of hot dogs when other people had eaten like a third of what, what this guy was eating. So he was mm -hmm. he was huge in the media. So they do a reality show called like Man vs. Beast or something like that yeah. where he has to go up against, it's people going up against animals 
and it's Kobayashi up against a bear eating mm-hmm. hot dogs. And so Kobayashi's sitting there stuffing his face with hot dogs, like, you know, like uh, dipping the bun in water and all that shit and like just like eating them like a machine. The bear just sort of like ambles up to the <laughs> hot dog tray and yeah. does nothing for 45 seconds and then just goes like, um, <laughs> um, and eats like 200 ta- hot dogs in two bites. It's and then amazing. Kobayashi loses. And then here's what was funny to me was the announcers go, oh, too bad, Kobayashi. I guess you're not the champion anymore. Oh, you were so great, but you've been defeated by the bear. And Kobayashi is just like, what? I, I spent my life pr- training for this. You got, you, you're comparing me to a bear. This is not a fair comparison. Mm-hmm. It's a fun stuff. They were treating it like he really lost his championship belt to the bear. To the bear. Uh, I, I, it that was broadcast- so disrespectful to him. That broadcast and also like Kobayashi is amazing in situations like that because he's such a showman that you're just yeah. like, is he serious about being upset about this? And the <laughs> like even just like the jingoistic like air of that broadcast, it's so like it's horrible and it's so silly at the same time where they pull out when Kobayashi loses and you see that the bear is somehow representing America. And you're like, how? <laughs> Does how like Kobayashi well, is representing grizzly, presumably. Japan and the bear is representing the U.S. and so that is why he <laughs> lost the championship. Um, it's so bizarre. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm I'm complete. I'm very obsessed with the Nathan's contest. I was there this year, um, and I have sort of slowly been uh, trying to be more uh, to just know as much as I humanly can. Uh, about the about that you're a fan. world. You, you, I mean, you again. You're very critical of the contest and its jingoism and and uh, the fact that it's you know uh, elevates this homegrown hero Joey Chestnut who eats a wonderful amount of hot dogs, but is sure does. you know the way he's been presented as as the great white hope. Uh, frankly, against uh, uh, against Kobayashi. Um, but at the same time, you're a fan and you have a crush on Joey Chestnut and you met him. So what was that like? I do. It was so great. It was awesome. It was the best day of my life. Uh, I am still, I mean, as far as a hot dog eating fan, Kobayashi is the greatest of all time. As far as my crush on Joey Chestnut, it's, well, it's just true. Like, it's true. Like, not even in a way that I'm, I'm not even trying to dunk on Joey. It's just that all of the techniques that every single hot dog eater uses in the U.S. now was taken from Kobayashi's method. So even if you can eat more hot dogs than Kobayashi, I don't feel that you are more impactful or influential on this part because he brought the technique, he brought the showmanship, and he popularized the sport in the U.S. So it's like, what are you going to wow. do? I love this take, but I have to ask you, who can eat more hot dogs? <laughs> I do think that Joey does eat more hot dogs. <laughs> I think I, Joey eats Joey, more hot dogs. <laughs> Joey eats a shitload of hot dogs. He's a monster. I really... Love him. Yeah, no, I got to like, uh, I got invited to their like after party this year and I was like perseverating and I was like, oh, I'm going to meet Joey. This is, I hope. And it was really, and yeah, I, I met him and he was very nice and he's like, oh, don't you pretend to be married to me? And I was like, yes. He's like, okay, let's take a picture. <laughs> and we did. I, I really love that you met your crush. Right after your crush had eaten, what, 70 to 100 hot dogs? Like, he was, was just walking around with a giant hot dog belly? He was chilling. Like, he was, I, I was uh, reporting on two other eaters, uh, Megabyte Ronnie and Mary Bowers, who are both the greatest. That's, like, part of why I like it is there's the, at the highest level, there are a bunch of assholes. And the way that the, the contest is presented can be really, really jingoistic and has been consistently. But there are competitors who are just fucking amazing and so and like are actively trying to change that and i'm very interested in that effort so um oh i forgot what i was saying i was just getting excited about hot dogs uh (laughs) uh but yeah i mean but there was um something that i was talking about with someone i was profiling uh woman mary bowers i was asking about like why are you able to have an after party? How are you not so physically ill? Like, how do you guys party after the contest? And she said it in a way that like, I don't think it was supposed to sound like tragic, but it did feel tragic to hear where she was like, well, you know, like when you train the way that we do and your stomach gets really expanded, you can eat a lot, but it's impossible to ever really feel full again. So you can kind of just go out and do whatever you want. And you're like, whoa, that sounds like a biblical plague. You can never feel full again. 
So Joey was like full of hot dogs physically, but I don't think he felt full. And and what about eating a hot dog on a normal day? He can never feel full. Like he can never be hungry and then just eat a normal amount of mo- food and be satiated. I guess so. I mean, I don't know if that's, but but Mary and, and Ronnie seem to agree that that's a generally true thing where you just have to develop a lot of discipline of like stopping yourself from eating because once your stomach is like trained to fit that many hot dogs you could keep going <laughs> like you could just keep going oh uh, yeah you just go to a fourth of july picnic and you're just like ah, bah, bah, bah. people are like dude, dude you're not on the it. clock today yeah <laughs> but you seem to imply and, and i i, I want to know if you have a firm stance on this that after the hot dog eating contest and this is what everybody wonders After Mm -hmm. the hot dog eating contest, after they eat all the hot dogs and they stand there for half an hour and take all the press questions, Mm -hmm. that they do eventually go in the back and barf. That was my theory at the time. Now, I don't know. I truly don't know. Really? I I feel – and and I mean because I haven't spent time with – uh, you know, an eating champion immediately after a contest. So I'm sure that some do, but I used to, I mean, yeah, two years ago, I would have been like, they all definitely do blah, blah, blah. But now I'm like, I really genuinely do not think that all of them do. Uh, I think that they're, and, and, um, I don't know, also just discussing like how that physically affects you that much food where, um, you know, obviously the day after it's a lot of poop. That's <laughs> just, yeah. physically Absolutely. what happens. But I, mean, I guess which way would you rather have 70 hot dogs come back out is the question. Oh, like, I think that's like a how you were raised thing. I was from like a poop family. I would rather it be poop. I would. I don't like throwing up. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm really sorry to everybody who's listening to this <laughs> maybe while you're eating or drinking. I'm so, I, we, we should have maybe put a content warning on this part of it because I know some people have very uh, ver- very strong feelings about this kind of thing. Um, but, the- but I do think there's a sort of, for that reason, there's a perverse fascination with eating contests because yes. some people watch it, but they are simultaneously so utterly revolted by it that they are horrified. And I think that's part of the appeal. Yeah, I think that like it's it's that and it's also that it's like the only – like televised sport. I think it is a sport. Not everyone agrees with me there, but there's a lot of training and it's, there's a league. So I, I feel like that's a sport. Uh, but I feel like it's like one of the only sports you can turn on and be like, oh, I could, I could do that. I could do that if I really wanted to. And like, you could not, but you feel like you could uh, in a way that feels weirdly equalizing because like everyone has eaten too much at some point in their life. Yes, um, but I eat too much for fun. I don't want to turn that into something I need to practice at. The, like Eating is one of my great joys in life. I don't want to make that a hobby or a job. That would destroy yeah. the pleasure of eating. I really, yeah, I was like, I, I have not achieved a uh, balance with my body image to be able to do it, but it is fascinating watching someone that can, but yeah, day one is the physical aspect. Day two, I didn't know about until I was doing interviews this year. I guess day two, there was a huge like serotonin crash, uh, from like, I don't know, just the, the high of being both on TV and consuming so much chemicals that a few days later, um, yeah, the, the woman I was, I was interviewing was like, you know, I'm, I've like not a, never had issues with depression, but like July 6th is the hardest day of the year for me. I get so depressed. All of my like ha- joy chemicals are completely depleted. And then by July 8th, I'm back, but it's like a precarious couple of days, like mentally and physically it's wild. Well, surely not the first person to get depressed because they ate hot dogs. <laughs> Uh, I think no, I can speak I think to that. We've all been there, <laughs> um, but I'd love to just end on God. This has been such a, a wonderful uh, tour de force you've taken us on. Uh, <laughs> and by the way, on our for our Patreon subscribers, we are going to be doing a book club with you, yeah. where uh, we've read the book together, and we're going to be having a nice live chat with the author over Zoom. It's going to be so much fun. I'm Head so to Patreon.com/slash Adam Conover if you want to join. You don't have to have read the book to join, but if you if you have and you want to, you can. Um, for a fun final question. I just want to ask, what is your perfect hot dog? You described so many hot dogs, the bun, you know, are we talking grilled? Are we talking, is the bun grilled, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. You know, could you assemble in your mind for us 
what your ideal hot dog would be of all of the components that you have tasted over the course of your journey so we can all imagine it together. Yes. Uh, so just before I say it, I this is the perfect hot dog for me. And it's not going to be the perfect hot dog for everybody. And if you like things that I don't, that's okay. And you don't need to contact me about it. And that's <laughs> fine. Don't and I ask respect Jamie. It. Don't yuck her yum. All right. I just am so afraid of Chicago hot dog fans. Um, oh, I, oh my God. You took such a brave stance against the Chicago hot dog. I, I, you think I was brave for saying the New York hot dogs were not bad, which is just obviously true. I was for saying they were bad. Yeah. Uh, but you you saying, and I was like, Jamie is, uh, she's in danger. I like, got booed at my own book release show in Chicago. <laughs> it was, <laughs> I really fucked around and found out with, <laughs> with Chicago. <laughs> Chicago people are so, look, Chicago's a wonderful city, but the they're best, insecure yeah. about it. They're insecure yeah. and defensive. In a way and that's not necessary. It's great there. I understand. I understand why they feel that way, you know, uh, you know, the third coast and all that, right? It doesn't mm -hmm. get the love it deserves as a city. I agree with that. Sure. But as a result, they're defensive about things that uh, they, uh, you know, are not actually that great. Um, yeah. uh, <laughs> I, that That's all. I, I, yeah. Much love to everybody in Chicago, but, you, you know, have some self-confidence is yeah, what I would say. Uh, just grab a bottle of ketchup and, you know, chug it. Uh, <laughs> my perfect Oh my hot God, dog. the ketchup people. Oh, fuck the ketchup, you. All right. It's a lot. So I do put ketchup on my hot dog and not everyone's going to be okay with that. I I, I love it. I toast it the bun. I, I love a toasted bun. I feel like yes. it just gives you more. Uh, I love... a I love a half smoke, but most importantly, I want my hot dog split and grilled. That is critical. Split. I, like. I love. Yeah. Yes. Because then you get extra char. And then yeah. you also. it You get a little. Uh, you know. Passage. For your ketchup. Your mustard. Your relish. And that's what I do. I do a standard hot dog. Uh, I. You know. I'm not picky about what's in it. Uh, but I. Uh, and as far as like the meat. I like it. I like an all beef hot dog. But I'm. I'm flexible there. Um, split grilled toasted bun ketchup mustard relish done i'm all that's the, you're making me hungry right now despite knowing all the horrible facts that i know about how hot dogs are made <laughs> um and and that contradiction is at the soul of this book and that's mm -hmm. what i love so much about it that it made me revolted and hungry at the same time just like i feel when watching joey chestnut scarf down 70 hot dogs exactly um, <laughs> and so the book's called raw dog i really hope people check us out uh, check it out. You can join us on uh, Patreon for our book club at patreon.com slash Adam Conover. Uh, mm -hmm. Jamie, where can people uh, find you and uh, uh, follow your work? Uh, yeah, you can follow me on, I guess, Instagram is the best place right now uh, at Jamie Christ Superstar. And I genuinely, I am curious about new, I've, I, when I was going on the book tour, I found out even more hot dog facts that uh, fascinated and revolted <laughs> me. And I feel like I, I, I could keep talking about hot dogs forever. So if you have a fascinating hot dog anecdote, I am amenable. I would like to know what it is. Oh, my God. We'll get those in the book club. And by the way, if you want to pick up a copy of the book, you can get it at factuallypod.com slash books. Jamie Loftus, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. This is so fun. Well, thank you once again to Jamie for coming on the show. Again, if you want to pick up a copy of the book, you can get it at factuallypod.com slash books. Hope you do. It's wonderful. And you can join us on our Patreon book club in just a couple weeks if you're interested. If you want to join that book club, that URL is patreon.com slash Adam Conover. Five bucks a month gets you every episode of the show ad-free. All those great community features. For 15 bucks a month, I will read your name on this very show. So I want to thank Ryan Cowler, John McAvee, Scott Kaler, Algie Williams, and Doug Arlie and everybody else who supports the show at the $15 a month level. I want to thank my producers, Tony Wilson and Sam Roudman, everybody here at HeadGum for making the show possible. If you want to find my tickets and tour dates, head to adamconover.net. I'm at Adam Conover wherever you get your social media. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time on Factually. That was a HeadGum podcast. <laughs>